first is fill in the blank with whatever. I am not blank enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not experienced enough. I'm not old enough. I'm too old. You know, I mean, we can flip that, but on some level, there's this belief that we do not have enough of something in order to create the success that we want in our life. You're listening to let's get stabby. I'm your host, Lauren Andrews. Join me as we poke holes in the patriarchy by sharing the stories of badass women founders. Tune in to hear directly from these unicorns who are using their businesses to make the world a better place. If you're wanting more sisterhood and solidarity in your life, I'd like to invite you to join our next magic hour. You can learn more at unicornexchange.com slash events. Without further ado, let's get stabby. Awesome. I am here with Lee Shea McDonough. After over a decade as a clinical social worker and public health professional, Lee became credentialed as a coach through the International Coach Federation and now provides ICF accreditation continuing coach education. She is the CEO and founder of Coach with Clarity, a training and education company for life and business coaches. And she's also the host of Coach with Clarity podcast and author of the number one Amazon book, Act on Your Business. Lee, thank you so much for for joining us here today. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So as tradition goes in the let's get stabby universe, we're going to start with an icebreaker question from best self. And this one's super fun. Okay. What song best defines your life? <gasps> oh my goodness. That is such <laughs> a good question. And I love the idea of an icebreakers deck. That is so cool. Oh, it's amazing. Um, I love them. I think if I had to pick just one song that kind of defines like where I'm at right now, I want to be like really thoughtful about this. It's, it's hard, right? I it is it hard, right? Like, Jesus, like what would my song be? Spice up your life? Probably anything by Spice well, that's Girls. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a very good one. Honestly, you know, the one that keeps, this is so cheesy, but the one that keeps coming up for me right now is the one, this is going to be the best day of my life. You, you know that song? Um, this is going to be the best day of my life. My life. Uh, oh, uh, yes. Uh, 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 you know that one? That was a great addition. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go with that because there's, there's like this optimism in there. It's not like this is the best day. It's this is going to be the best day mm. of my life. And it's like, we're starting off with that intention and that energy. And I find it really empowering because it's not a matter of like, what's going to happen to me to make this day a good day. It's going to be like, no, like what can I contribute to make this the best day? And that's especially given everything we've been through in 2020, I just feel like the more we can find our own sense of agency and the more we can see how we contribute, like that's where we find our power. So I'm going to go with that one. Oh my God. I love that. So I'm curious, kind of on an opposite note. Yeah. Where, whenever you transitioned into being a social worker and public health professional, what did, what was your life like then before you decided that this is what you wanted to be is that you wanted to be the founder of coach with clarity. I'm sure it had many iterations before that. What was life oh, yeah. like before? Yes. So before I moved into coaching, um, I was a clinical social worker for almost 15 years. And at that time, my husband was in the air force. So I was a military spouse and I was used to moving every three to five years and I, you know, it's interesting because I'm really grateful to the Air Force. We had a lot of adventures as a result. We got to live in Germany for four years from 2011 to 2015. It was phenomenal. So fun. Um, but I think also because we were moving often, we had the military lifestyle. I have two children and at the time they were much younger. Like they were, they were definitely in that toddler and then um, early, early childhood stage. That was such a whirlwind of a time. I look back and I'm like, how did I do all of this? How did I hold down a job, get my clinical license, birth and raise two kids, support my active duty husband, move my entire family and our dog across the Atlantic. Like I kind of <laughs> look back and I was like, Lee, you were a badass. <laughs> I mean, yeah. my goodness. Um, so 
that's kind of like, there was a lot going on in the period of time before I became a coach and I loved it. And I loved that, that tempo. But I think then once my husband got out of the air force and we moved back to the States and we really established roots here, I finally felt like, okay, things are stable. We're not moving. I know a little bit more of what to expect. And now is the time where I can really create roots, not just personally, but also professionally. And if ever there was a time where I was going to start my own business and really move forward, this is it. Okay. So I'm about to go down a rabbit hole. Good. So I love it. you had mentioned that you really love that tempo at your time in life. And one thing that became really clear to me and kind of a running joke almost between uh, some friends, actually some other CEOs was, you know, we operate really well during crisis because we grew up in certain states of that. And we, you know, certain childhood traumas, they can relate to you being really great in crisis situations and you really thrive in that. Is that kind of what you were experiencing or was that different? No, I think that's fair. I think I, and I always have been the kind of person where when there's a crisis, I get laser focused yeah. and I'm good. And it's like actually, laser beams really activate, right? And you're just like, that's all right. right, this is what I was and, made for. <laughs> yes. And then after, after we get through the crisis, that's when I have my anxiety moment. It's yeah. really funny. I don't generally get performance anxiety. Um, I Before I did therapy and so forth, I was a theater major in college. I grew up doing community theater. And so the the idea of being on a stage was always very comfortable for me. And so I didn't get nervous before or during an audition or a show. I would get nervous after when I would like replay in my head what happened. Yes. And that still happens to me today. Like I remember about a year and a half ago, my family and I were kind of in the mountains of North Carolina in a remote place with no cell service. And we got a flat tire. And it was, it was like 10 o'clock at night. It was dark. Ugh. Fortunately, we were able to kind of roll the car into a church parking lot that had a street lamp. And I was just like, we got to change this tire. And so like, boom, 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 we got the tire changed. And then on the drive home, I full on broke down crying like, oh my God, what if this had happened? What if this had happened? And so that's kind of, that, that really tends to be what I do. I can get really sharp in the moment and handle a crisis well. And it's after the fact where like that adrenaline kind of kicks in. Um, and so it's, it's, an, it's interesting. I think, and my, you know, maybe, maybe just, I think I was rewarded for that growing up. The fact that mm -hmm. like, I could be the dependable one and like, don't Solve worry about it. He's got it covered. You. Yeah. Yes. And that's definitely served me as a therapist when I was dealing with clients in crisis. It serves me now as a coach when I'm, you know, working with my clients who are not in the same type of active crisis, but they've got a lot going on that they need support on. And so I am, I am grateful for that. That's so amazing. Um, that actually brings me back to something we were talking about previously um, with I, that I shared that I really love that you have this accredited background. And I feel like in the coaching industry, especially in the entrepreneur business niche, that there's kind of a bad rep every so often that pops up amongst different pockets of the internet to where it's like, oh, anyone can be a coach. Everyone's a coach. And you kind of get yeah. this curmudgeon trolls of the internet, right? Um, yeah. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like accreditation really is something that all coaches should go towards before dealing with, or do you feel like there's maybe like certain niches that, um, really need that accreditation? Cause, um, I'm going back to the, in our conversation, I told you about, there's a not-for-profit in town who, that it drives me nuts because they provide quote counseling quote services, um, to women who've been sex trafficked and they absolutely have no, counseling, license, yeah. accreditation, background, absolutely nothing. They're just people who want to help, which is great, but dealing with something like trauma. Um, I had shared with you a couple instances and I'm like, they're doing more harm and they don't see it. And it's driving me crazy. Uh, do you feel like that kind of bleeds over into the coaching world ever? And if so, like when, when should you choose between like a coach that's accredited and not, I guess. Yes. Oh, okay. We can like really dig into this. The worms, excited. the can is open. <laughs> Let's do this. So it is true that anyone can call themselves a coach because coaching is a self-regulated industry. And what I mean by that is that 
the federal and state governments don't provide oversight for coaching the way they do other licensed professions like therapy, like medicine, like law. So there is a low bar to entry for coaching. And the great thing about that is that as an entrepreneur, as someone who's motivated, there's, you can get your coaching practice up and running and not have a lot of red tape to deal with. And so I do appreciate that the coaching industry is readily accessible. The downside, of course, is that that really puts the onus on the client, on the consumer to do their homework and to ensure that the coach they're working with knows what they're doing. I would say accreditation is one path, not the only path, but one path that kind of shows this coach knows what they're doing. Because when you're working with a coach that has a credential, especially from the International Coaching Federation, you know that that person has been through a certain amount of training. They have Mm -hmm. a certain amount of experience that's been validated. They've been working with a mentor coach. They've passed a written exam and an oral exam. I mean, it's pretty rigorous. So in that sense, having a credential behind your name does signal to the public, I take this seriously, I know what I'm doing, and here's my proof. But I want to be clear that I don't think that's the only path. And especially for people that bring a lot of experience and education from other fields that are very focused on human service work, such as therapy and even human resource management and so forth, those people may not need a full on soup to nuts coach training program. I would argue Mm -hmm. though that every coach, including those with experience would benefit from coach specific education. That might look like a self-study program that you put together with podcasts and books, and you're working with your own coach and you're really investing in your own development as a coach. It might look like working with the continuing education program that's accredited by ICF. Um, so yeah, I think that there's multiple paths to becoming, um, a well-trained successful coach. And I don't want to sit here and say that one is better than another, but I will encourage coaches to choose a path and to really take ownership of your professional development as a coach. Oh, that's so interesting. Is there any, so, okay. First question that comes to mind. Whenever someone's looking for, let's say, uh, just a life coach in general, they need to get their shit together. They feel scattered. What are some best resources or things to keep in mind when picking that coach besides, okay, do they have accreditation or not? What are some other signs to actually look out for to be like, okay, this is, this is my person. That's really going to help me transform my life. Well, many coaches will offer, say, a 15 or 20 minute consult. Some coaches will even do a a session with you complimentary. And that time is for both the coach and client to assess each other and to assess fit to see if this would be a good working relationship. So I do think it's important to at least have that initial interview, if not a, a true coaching session, both for the coach and the client, because both people need to be fully on board. As the client, I would also be interested in knowing about that coach's background. So have they gone through any coach specific training? What, when, what does it look like? Are you accredited? If so, from what organization? Because some organizations will, you pay your $49 on Udemy and you pass a class and boom, you have a certificate. (laughs) Yeah. Very different than someone who's done a 125 hour training program. That's also had 80 hours of coaching experience. I mean, it really runs the gamut. So ask the questions, dig deeper. And then I do think this is also an area where references or testimonials can be helpful. So you can see how this coach has worked with and served other people. And it's interesting because I just had a phone call last week with someone who was all set to sign on the dotted line with the coach and then asked for references. And the coach turned around and said, I don't do that. I don't provide references. And really, you have everything you need to be successful. And no reference is going to invalidate that. So you really just need to trust in yourself. And I was like, that Mm -hmm. is complete BS, right? Sketchy. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I just thought to myself, yes, you do have everything you need to create the success that you want. I'm not arguing with that. But that doesn't negate your fully legitimate request to ask for references. So I would say, 
yeah. And so for her, that understandably raised a red flag. And I said, yeah, you know what? It would for me too. I ask for references. I provide references as a coach. So I would say that's an important part of vetting your coach and just making sure that, yes, this is someone that I want to invest, not just the money with, but the time and the energy, because at the heart of coaching is the relationship. And you want to make sure that you are really simpatico with someone before you take the next step. So true. And I'm curious too, taking just one more step back, how do you know it's time to get a coach? My questions about that are number one, to what extent are you achieving your goals? Do you even know what your goals are? What's your big picture vision and, and how's it going? Number two is how are you feeling about the process of achieving your goals? Because I work with a lot of people who are highly ambitious very focused and they are achieving their goals right and left and they're miserable while they're doing it. Mm. So that I think is equally as important to consider as whether you are, you know, hitting every benchmark. So I want to work with people that either want some support in refining their vision and then creating a, an action plan that's going to get them there, but not at all costs. I want to do it in a way that's aligned with their values so that what matters most to them is fully expressed in the action they're taking in their life. And so that to me is really where someone can figure out, would I benefit from working with a coach? How am I doing on achieving my goals and how am I feeling about achieving my goals? I love that. That is the simplest, most digestible way to put it. It's so funny. I was thinking back whenever I was preparing for our conversation, I'm like, huh, what's my experience been with coaching so on and so forth, just kind of doing an inventory check. And really the first time I was introduced to life coaching was from, um, right out of college, my first boss, um, I was in nonprofit world. She was a, a licensed professional counselor, and she was thinking about transitioning into life coaching as a counselor. And she just didn't want to work with such the heavy trauma and really on demand kind of side of counseling and therapy. And she wanted to work with people on getting through those blocks that they had in life. And so I've always had a very therapeutic mindset of it since that was my first initial impression of it, yeah. but how you're saying it, are you reaching your goals? Are you happy doing it? How easy is that? <laughs> yeah. And that and really I think helps break it down into the niche too. Cause it's like, okay, with money, are you reaching your goals with your career, with your family, so on and so forth? you can very easily do an inventory on all areas of your life and say, okay, is this what I want? Am I happy? If it's no, then you probably should work with someone on that. <laughs> That's exactly right. I think good coaching knows how to blend the external with the internal. And what I mean by that is the external is about those goals that we're setting, the work that we're doing out in the world, what that looks like. But mm. if we're only focusing on that and we're not interested in the internal experience, then we're doing a disservice to our clients. We need to be aware of what our clients are thinking and feeling about the work that they're doing. And that's where mindset work comes in. And I know a lot of coaches talk about mindset work. And the way I view it is how we relate to our internal private processes. So our thoughts, our feelings, our memories, our sensations, the things that we are very aware of, but someone from the outside might not know we're experiencing. Someone won't know a thought that I'm having or a feeling I'm having unless I tell them. So when we look at mindset, that's the work that we're doing. And we're focusing on what the current processes are, how they are working for us, and what, if any, tweaks need to be made so that we can be in greater alignment with what matters most to us. Again, everything mm. I do, all of the work I do is really anchored in a person's values because if someone is taking action that's not aligned with their values, then they're not going to feel good about it, no matter what the outcome is. What's the biggest mind trash that you see over and over again that people really need to focus on mindset? Is there kind of a reoccurring theme that you see? Yeah, there is actually. And it manifests itself in different messages. So this is going to look different for everyone. But at the heart of it is this belief that we are unworthy as we are. Mm. That there's something about us that is deficient or lacking and therefore we're not worthy. I knew that. I was like, it's going to be worthy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it is. you, you mentioned it shows up in different ways. 
what are the most common ways that that shows up? Cause I think it's really easy to be like, of course I'm worthy. I'm great. I'm fine. Really? Yeah. But you know, um, someone asks you how you are. I'm fine. I'm fine. But if you're not really fine, if you're not seeing yourself as worthy, what, how does that actually translate into actual thoughts that maybe some of our listeners are having? Yeah, I think in a few different ways. First is fill in the blank with whatever. I am not blank enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not experienced enough. I'm not old enough. I'm too old. You know, I mean, we can flip that. But on some level, there's this belief that we do not have enough of something in order to create the success that we want in our life. And again, that comes back to somehow lacking something uh, instead of really embracing our fullness and our wholeness as we are. So there's certainly this enoughness piece. And then I also see a lot with coaches and entrepreneurs, the concept of imposter syndrome, this mm -hmm. idea that I'm not really as good as people think I'm going to, I'm going to be found out. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, and so that's kind of a different way that the not good enough shows up. Imposter syndrome is tricky because it generally comes as we are about to really step into our big, bold selves or while we are doing something really big and the, the voices of doubt and uncertainty kind of come in and start questioning, who do you think you are to be doing this? And you know, what if, what if you get caught? What if you get in trouble? What if you get found out? So imposter syndrome is another big thing that I see when doing mindset work with, uh, with coaches and clients alike. Do you have any quick tips or tricks or maybe a favorite method to really squash imposter syndrome? Yes, I've got a few actually, but I think it really starts with understanding the purpose of imposter syndrome. And if we approach Ooh. it from the idea that our mind is trying to help us, then I think we can really change our relationship to imposter syndrome. Because when you think about it, our mind's duty is to keep us safe at all yes. costs. And as humans, that's why we've, you know, managed to exist for as long as we have. We have stayed safe and our species has, you know, been our successful. Our minds have done their job. Imposter syndrome. They have. Let's job. <laughs> They have. And the way the mind does that is it views, at, you know, it, it evaluates the things around us as whether it's a threat or not. Very helpful, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago when we were facing legitimate life and death threats every day, you know, hunting and is that animal going to attack me? And uh, is that tribe going to harm my tribe? I mean, this, this was really kind of life and death stuff. However, our minds have not evolved as fast as our society has. And so we are still processing external threats the same way, even though the idea that our boss might get mad at us or someone might post something nasty on an Instagram post uh, is not the same level of life or death threat. Like, I'm not saying it's, yeah. it's pleasant. It's not, but like, we are not going to be physically harmed. Our mind isn't processing it that way. It just sees it as something unsafe that we shouldn't be doing. And so how does it support us? It feeds us all of these messages designed to keep us small and safe and in the box. Don't put yourself out there. Don't be seen. Don't be an expert. Don't do all of these things because if you do that, you're going to put yourself out there. You're going to be more visible and therefore you're going to be more prone to attack. That's not safe. Mm. So knock it off. And it's going to use every tool in the toolbox to do that. And so some of that mind chatter about not being good enough, smart enough, people are going to judge you that it's effective because it does silence so many people. So when we can view that process as something not that's wrong with us or something going wrong, but actually it's our mind doing its job, then all of a sudden we can view it in a way of, oh, okay, well, it makes sense that this is happening, but I don't need this level of protection right now. This isn't yeah. a threat. This is actually something I need to do in order to take the next step. And then that's where we get back our sense of power and our sense of agency. And we can rewrite the message so that it becomes something that will serve us. That's so good. It makes me think of a couple of years ago, whenever Facebook live came out and there were tons of going live challenges to where it was groups of people that would band together and they would promise to go live on Facebook, you know, 10 days in a row. And I think this, you know, still goes along, but it really speaks to that imposter syndrome. And really that visibility is vulnerability. I think mm -hmm. is the main thing to where if you're out there and you're unscripted in front of 
your thousand, 5,000 friends, then you're prone to attack. Maybe that is true with, you know, all the trolls that the internet brings, but you're not going to die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I, part of it is a willingness to experience some discomfort in the service of what matters most to us. And yeah. so the question that I always come back to is what am I willing to have in order to get what I want? You know, mm. if what I want is a thriving business or deep relationships with my partner or my family or my friends, or, you know, fill in the blank with your goal, if that's what I want, what am I willing to have in order to get that? Can I make room for discomfort for tough times for, you know, again, fill in the blank, but can I make room for that? Knowing that, yes, this is a part of the experience and I can't just cherry pick what feels good and what doesn't. I have to create space for all of it. Now, that, of course, there are times where our mind is doing its job. It is keeping us safe. And we need to evaluate whether this is a time where, oh, this isn't the right decision. I do need to pull back. Um, and that's where the process of discernment comes in. And because yeah. as, as humans, we're able to kind of tease out, is this a real threat or is this a mind generated threat? So I don't mean to suggest that everything should be ignored completely, but, but, but we do need to be mindful that our brain's going to go on high alert more often than maybe is necessary. So true. I mean, I think that's the perfect example, going back to posting something on Facebook and sharing your offer with the world, right? There might be discomfort, but you're going to be safe. You're going to be okay. At the end of the day, it's evaluating that discernment and what you can and can't do. So I'd love to actually switch gears a bit and talk mm -hmm. about what you do, because you actually are, you, you teach coaches how to build their business. And one thing that you really said that stood out to me was that, um, that there is a way that consultants can actually utilize coaching habits and tips and tricks and techniques to really up their agency consultancy game. And I thought that was so interesting because I had been a business coach for about a year. I gave it a go. I had a program. Um, I loved it, but I hated it. It was not, <laughs> I, I love consulting on a one-off basis, but having a program where I'm guiding people through a process was not my jam. And whenever you said that, I was like, huh, I wonder how that would have changed if I would have put more coaching techniques into the actual consultancy side of things. Uh, can you speak more to that and how you see those two correlating and helping each other? I would love to, because I do believe in the power of coaching and it's not limited to only coaches being able to do that. I For think sure. all of us can tap into these coaching skills. What I see and what I've experienced working with consultants in the past is that they are so knowledgeable in their area of expertise, and they're so excited to share that knowledge and to use it to help other people. So I want to come from a place of, of, of respect for consultants, and I don't mean to suggest they're doing anything wrong because they're not. Uh, they are wise and highly trained, and many of them are coming from a service-oriented perspective. Where things get missed sometimes, though, is the disconnect between what the consultant is sharing and what, what they're ready to do and where the client is and what they're ready to do. And so I have been on the receiving end where a consultant has come in and said, okay, this is what you want. This is what you have. This is what you don't have. We need to do this, this, this. Here's your plan. Here's how we're going to do it. Okay, let's go. And I had no doubt in their expertise and their knowledge, and I was pretty confident they were right. But I wasn't fully on board because not only did I not fully understand it, I wasn't convinced they really understood me. Ooh. And yes. And so that's where when we can bring coaching skills into the process and we can focus on building the relationship, you can then take a more consultant oriented approach 
and your client is going to be more satisfied and the outcome is going to be better and certainly longer lasting because your client feels heard and they feel like they are partnering with you in the process. You can still come in and have your approach, but we're factoring in the client's values, what motivates them, what they want. And at the end of the day, the single most important coaching skill that a consultant can use is active listening. When our clients feel heard and understood, and we do that, there's like, I call it the care model, C-A-R-E. C stands for confirm, where we're confirming that we heard what the client said, and that can look like a simple restatement. Then from confirming, we move on to affirming, which is letting them know that what they've said makes sense. It's understandable that they might think or feel this way given X, Y, Z. So we contextualize what the client is saying. So we've confirmed them and affirmed them. Then the R is request. We then request permission to go to the next stage to, and that, and that leads to E, which is engage. But before we go right into engage, let me tell you everything and what I want to do, because that's where a lot of consultants start. We need to start with confirming, affirming, and requesting permission. That's going to build trust. It's going to build the relationship. You're going to learn more about your clients. They're going to feel more deeply connected to you so that when you do engage, they're going to be with you hundred percent. That's so amazing. I just think about all the different companies and people I've worked with and all my other friends who have agencies. And this is like such a big issue. I, as you're talking about this, I'm just like, yeah, I feel like, you know, everyone who has clients, there's usually one or two that they actually enjoy working with and the rest, they're just like, I can't wait to fire them, you know, get done with that. And sometimes there's actual, like, you know, they're miserable humans. Um, but the other side of it, I think is that this might be the missing gap because there's so many miscommunications that can happen if you're not repeating back and over communicating, especially whenever I'm doing events, I've learned that I have to communicate things 20 times to every person involved in 20 different ways each time. Otherwise it's not going to get across. And I, that's really where that confirming and affirming piece that you just mentioned came into play. And I'm like, oh, wow, I wish I would have learned that five years ago instead of learning it the hard way of having to really over communicate. And I also love the shift of in my head, I've been like, I always have to over communicate but really it's just a matter of confirming and affirming in the communication. I think that's a great shift that I, great takeaway. I <laughs> I'm so glad. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because as we talk it through on the surface, it, it seems pretty simple. Like, oh, I have to listen. I have to mm -hmm. make sure my client knows that I hear them. And that is a simple concept, but just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yes. And in my training programs, I actually spend a lot of time talking about what are some of the nuances to this? What are ways that we communicate that? So, you know, we take the care model and we go even deeper with it, but really at the end of the day, it just comes back to helping people feel heard and understood because mm -hmm. when we think about the interactions we have on a given day, we don't always get that, you yeah. know, we'll, 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 well, in, you know, pre COVID times, you know, we'll go out and, you know, talk to our cashier or our, our server or so forth. And it's always, Hey, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? Fine. Thanks. It's like, but we're not really asking or, or we're not really listening for the, how yeah. are you really? Yeah. And so if you as a consultant or coach or business owner can give someone just 30 seconds of undivided attention where you're deeply listening to them. What a gift. What so a gift. True. And this applies how to your customers too. Even if you don't have an agency with clients, whatever you're providing, you can do this with your customers and get great feedback on how you can improve your product or maybe where there's a miscommunication in your message market match. There's so many ways that this could be applied. I absolutely love this. <laughs> so before we wrap up, I know we're getting close to time. Tell me about your book. Oh, yes. So uh, I'm really proud of my first book. It's called Act on Your Business, Braving the Storms of Entrepreneurship and Creating Success Through Meaning, Mindset, and Mindfulness. So I published fun. it in February of 2019. And it's essentially my take on an approach called acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, which I have been trained in and have been using for over 
gosh, over 12 years. Um, I'm taking the principles of ACT and I'm applying them to a small business and entrepreneurial space. So as the name suggests, it is a therapeutic approach. Uh, and it's one that I initially trained in back in 2009 when I worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And it's highly effective when working with depression, anxiety, trauma, and the like. But it's also flexible enough that the tenants can be applied universally even when there's no mental health history or diagnosis present because it focuses on getting really clear about what matters most to you, so your core values, taking action in a way that's aligned with those values, uh, creating a new relationship with your thoughts and feelings. So that's the mindset piece. And then finally, incorporating mindfulness so that we are staying anchored in the present moment, which connects us even deeper with our values. So it's really the three M's, meaning, mindset, and mindfulness are tools that all of us can use at any time to feel a deeper sense of connection to and, and fulfillment about the work we do in our lives and the relationships we create. So I'm very passionate about this because I've seen it both as a therapist, as a coach, as a mom, as a spouse, and also as a human being who has used the tools herself as well. It's, it's just such a flexible, compassionate approach. And, um, yeah. So I decided, you know what, I, I want the whole world to know about this, especially in the small business space. And so I wrote a book. I love it. And so where can we find this at? Yes. The best place to find it is at Amazon. So if you search for act on your business, or if you search my name, Lee Shea McDonough, uh, it'll come up and it's available on Kindle and paperback. Amazing. And you have so many other resources too, that I want to make sure our listeners know about, uh, particularly your coaching quiz. So that's yes. at coachingquiz.com, correct? It is. And if you are interested in coaching, if you think that it's something you might want to incorporate into the work you're already doing, or if you're looking at maybe even transitioning into coaching, it might help to know what your coaching style is. And so I created a fun quick quiz. It's like seven questions and it helps you identify your coaching style. So yes, you can head to coachingquiz.com and take that. So fun. And you also mentioned if someone's wanting to start their own coaching business, you told me earlier that you actually have a 28 page guide to launching your coaching business, right? I do. It's called the coach with clarity business blueprint, and it walks you through step-by-step step everything you need to know to get your business up and running so that you can start welcoming clients in. So starting with what kind of coach do you want to be? Who do you want to serve? How do you create and price your offer? How do you connect with clients and referral sources? What do you do when someone's interested in your services? So it really walks you through all of the initial components so that you are positioned perfectly to launch your business and support the people you care about. Oh my God. That's so amazing. I love that. That's such good, actionable. I, I love how this conversation was so actionable. You gave our listeners so many things that they can take action on to really, when it comes down to choosing your coach, to working on your mindset with imposter syndrome. Is there anything else that you would like to leave our listeners with? If there is one piece of advice, one action that you hope they would take today, what would that be? Yes. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of cheat and do two because the first one was, I totally forgot to tell people where to get the blueprint, <laughs> which yes. is at coachwithclarity.com slash blueprint. So you can, you can download that there. So that would be number Perfect. one, but number two, I think, I think on some level, it's about getting really clear on what drives you, what matters most to you and what you want to stand for when we know what our values are, that's our guiding light. And that's going to keep us moving forward no matter what we face. So I think that would be my starting point for people is to think about really when, you're, when your life has come to an end, what do you wanna be known for? What principles do you want associated with you? How do you want people to view you? How do you want to view you at the end of the day? When we know what our values are, then that can inform the direction we take and it's gonna set us up so that when we're ready to set those goals and accomplish them, we're going to be doing so in a way that feels good. So that I think is first and foremost is to do some work around what matters most to you and then allow that to inform the actions that you take moving forward. I love that. Chase that clarity. It's amazing. Lee, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I have enjoyed every minute. Thank you for having me. And again, if you're interested in getting in touch with Lee, go ahead and head over to coachwithclarity.com or follow her on Instagram with 
at coach with clarity. Lee, it's been a pleasure. And again, that blueprint coach with clarity.com slash blueprint. You're going to want to make sure you get that. All these resources will be in the show notes until next time. Thank you so much. Remember, our next magic hour is coming up. So make sure you've RSVP'd. Head over to unicornexchange.com slash events. You can also find today's show notes there on the website under podcast, unicornexchange.com slash podcast. Can't wait to talk with you soon. Until the next episode, keep it stabby, unicorns.